Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. I grew up around all athletes around my house all the time, just giants. And, I mean, they would be around the house, they would come see my dad or come for Thanksgiving or, you know, whatever it was. But I grew up on the business side. So I always understood how devastating losing can be on that level. I guess in a way it's given me a really global perspective on sports, which honestly the average probably commentator doesn't really have. All right, Alex, this episode of The Deal, a little bit different because we got out of the studio and into a live audience. So Hannah Storm, she's a 30-year sports media veteran. She has a singular perspective on sports, business, and culture. I had watched her on TV forever. I had met her once. You know her a little bit. What did you think? First of all, I was a huge fan, like you. I remember even graduating from high school and watching her on TV. I just thought that she was a superstar because back in those days, Sports Center was everything. Yeah, I mean, it's also fascinating because you really can track the explosion of sports as just a key part of the culture through her career. And this is one of the things I found so interesting, especially given your relatively new role as an owner of a a basketball team, that she was at the white hot center of the NBA's 1990s explosion into the zeitgeist. She was NBA on NBC when those were the games that that people were really discovering at this critical moment for the league where Jordan gives way to Kobe and Shaq and LeBron. And she has sort of ridden that all the way through. But she also had this really interesting moment where she left sports altogether. She goes to morning television and now she's back in our lives in sports. And the other thing that I will say, she's hilarious. I mean, she is so funny. Yes, she is funny. And I loved the live audience and they were great. Yeah, they enjoyed it. She talked about the good, the bad and the ugly in a career that's been over three decades. And some of the highs, of course, was Michael Jordan and some of the great stories and how much she admired Michael. Yeah. You'll hear some great stories there that I've never heard before. And then some low moments in baseball in the dugout with Albert Bell, which I thought was also very interesting. And I learned a lot from there as well. And also, you know, as you mentioned, a pioneer in media and someone who, you know, had the wherewithal as she went on with her career to sort of take control of that. You know, she's been at the core of something that obviously is very interesting to both of us. I mean, talk about where your world and mine collide in terms of athletes, you know, telling their own stories and how do you do that successfully and and her ability to navigate those waters and navigate a media world that is changing so dramatically, practically uh, on a daily basis. I just I really, really loved it. On this episode of The Deal, Hannah Storm. Without further ado, Hannah, come on out. Hannah Storm. Hey. Thanks, you guys. Thanks. Oh, my gosh. Thank you for doing um, this. I can't, I can't believe that Alex is interviewing me. <laughs> this is so crazy. So we have so much to talk to you about. But let's talk about the current, if we can. Sure. We all care a lot about basketball. Yes. We're going to talk about how you grew up with it. But can we take a moment to talk about basketball do you okay, like can that? we talk about your team, the Minnesota Timberwolves? Like, yeah. that's super exciting. Thank I think you. it's great for the game, too, right? Thank because you. we tend to focus on sort of the, the glamour teams. But, you know, Minnesota's always been in it right there. But I'm super excited for you that they're Thank you, Hannah. reaching and it, a new level. You remember the early days with the Mariners. Yes. Uh, I always find it great when uh, a city or a team hasn't had a lot of wins in their past. And the fan base is just starving for a winner. Yeah. And I'm going to tell you, Minnesota is not only a basketball town, they're giddy. It's an exciting time. So thank you. See, as an owner, you like those sellouts, oh, yeah. don't you? <laughs> yeah. yeah. He's like, yeah. Now, yeah. when it comes to writing checks for players, we'll talk. Yeah, about yeah, it. yeah, 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 yeah. It's a different yeah. conversation. <laughs> but what is it that you feel like? I mean, you study this game. You talk mm-hmm. to everybody in yeah. it. You've seen the whole evolution. 
does it feel like something special is happening right now or has been? Ha- I don't know what. I mean, I love parody. So to our point, talking about the T-Wolves or talking about teams who haven't been in it in the past. I think it's great to have the Celtics, great to have the Warriors. And they, you know, may be on the downslide now. Like, we, we don't know what's going to happen with them at this point. We always have the Lakers, right? The New York teams have struggled for relevance, which has been disappointing. I mean, at times, like, the Knicks have shown sparks lately. But I think basketball is great when the big markets are doing well. But I think what's really exciting for me was seeing Denver win the title yeah. last year. Um, Denver was an old ABA team. Uh, They were one of the four teams that came over in the merger. That is a great basketball town. To your point, there are fan bases that are absolutely rabid hoops fan bases. Those fans have always been there. So, yes, I do think I love the parody that we're seeing, even though I would say the teams on both coasts, you know, I'll throw Philly in there. They get a lot of the attention, a lot of the media attention. We didn't really pay attention to Denver on a national level until like into right. the playoffs. Right. Right. And they end up winning the title. So I think it was a good lesson for everybody. Like, you know, let's talk about these other teams. Let's develop these stars. Um, unfortunately, we just kind of sometimes fall into the same old patterns with the same people. Staying along the same lines of, of the NBA and parody mm-hmm. over the last two, three decades, You've seen a lot of front offices, teams, culture. Obviously, we talk a lot about the Miami Heat. Mm -hmm. Maybe mention two or three that do a really good job with their continuity, their leadership, their messaging. Uh, Oh, Pat Riley, unbelievable. Championship coach has kept that Miami team relevant for so long. You know, you're right there. I mean, it's unbelievable not just bringing the big three in, but, but what Miami has been in recent days and impressive leaders like getting Jimmy Butler there was like a game changer, right? He could have stayed in Philly. But I think that Pat Riley has been able to sustain and build a champion in a, in a market where there's a lot of other stuff to do. Yeah. You know, so he comes to mind. I do think the Warriors have been a very well-run franchise through the years. You know, they've sustained what we could consider a modern-day dynasty. In a smaller market, San Antonio, obviously. Oh, well, Uh, Greg Popovich. Yeah, Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I mean, I covered San Antonio back in— I mean, I was there in, like, the Dennis Rodman days of San Antonio. Sustained excellence. Mm -hmm. That's a great example. All right, let's go all the way back. I mean, this is—and we're going to talk about a new podcast you have later on, but your DNA— is NBA, ABA, yeah, they, they, yeah. even so like all the way back. Yeah, all the way back. I mean, you you were effectively born into this game. Yeah. Tell us about it. Yeah, well, my dad was a sports executive. He was in the Marine Corps, but he always loved sports. He played football in the Marine Corps and he played football at Notre Dame for a brief time one year. But um, so he was in the Marine Corps. He had helped to start a Toys for Tots. I'm sure you guys have heard of that. We were in Chicago. He really wanted to get into sports. And the local team at the time, the Chicago Zephyrs, they just he was reading in the paper that they couldn't sell tickets. They just couldn't sell tickets to get people in the stand. So he literally went in to the office and said, if I can sell X number of tickets, I think it was like 600 or something like that. He was like, will you all hire me? <laughs> you know, will you like put me on staff? And they were really? like, sure, what, what do we have yeah. to lose? And so that's how he got his start in basketball. And then we were in Baltimore, Cincinnati, Indianapolis, Louisville, Memphis, Atlanta, Houston, wow. all different basketball teams. He was in baseball with the Astros. I mean, he did all sorts of crazy stuff, but mostly basketball. And he ended up being commissioner of the old ABA and setting the ABA and the NBA up for a merger in the mid 70s. So I, as long as I can remember when it wasn't a school night, we were at games. Yeah. And what I really remember is the referees' names because my mom had played basketball and she used to yell at the referees all the time. <laughs> no like, way. yell. We are in the front row. She is yelling, he walked to get you, you know? She's like yelling at the refs. So I remember the refs, all their names distinctly. <laughs> Yeah, so tell us about that. I mean, what was it? What was it like? Because we have this picture. I mean, you certainly have a very modern and intimate picture of the of the NBA. Like, what was it like? So, I mean, picture the NBA. Slam dunks came from the ABA. So, slam dunks were not allowed in the NCAA or the NBA. Not even in a warm up line. So, you're thinking about players who came out of like Dr. J, like out of Rucker Park, right, and out of places where they had these great showy 
moves, and get, which, which they were not allowed to do anywhere other than the ABA. Wow. Three-pointers, those came from the ABA. Now, a lot of old ABA guys are really upset right now at the way that three-pointers right. are used. A lot of people in the game are kind of upset that the three-pointer is a de facto shot, right? It's not like a secondary option. Teams that sort of run down the court and just launch three-pointers. I know there's a lot of basketball peers that don't like that, but the three-pointer came from their cheerleaders. Crazy halftimes, fun halftimes. They didn't have a TV contract, so they had to make it super entertaining, right? right? So think about all those elements that the players were allowed to come out of high school or college. That was not an option in the NBA. So when you think about like, personal empowerment, like player empowerment, like those things. For the first time, players had salary leverage. So they were like, well, I have a choice now. I can go to the ABA right. or the NBA. So, hey, I can negotiate a little, right? I do have to say one little story. Back when I was with the Mariners, I played with the Mariners from 94. I was up and down mm -hmm. to uh, 2000 was my last year there. So I remember back in those days, Hannah showed up to one of the stadiums and we're stretching as a team. And, you know, when you're a smaller market team, you never have the big national media. <laughs> and Hannah showed up early one day and we were all stretching. I was like, oh, that's a storm. <laughs> and Griffey saying, and Edgar Martinez. And she was a star amongst players. I mean, that, and, and by the way, back in those days when we came up, it's not like now where we have Hulu and Disney Plus. ESPN. Right. It was just one channel. I, I could just imagine the numbers you guys got back oh, then. Oh, yeah. Massive. Right. So every night at 11.30 or what, or in the money, what do you call it, the morning, uh, yeah. the rotation? Either it was like CNN every mm -hmm. night at 11.30, CNN Sports. And I did the baseball show mm -hmm. on CNN, NBC. I mean, you watched the That's NBA. It. You watched one game. Now you're going to watch a triple header, one network. Yeah. Right? So right. you think about it. The numbers were insane. So when she showed up as a player... You knew it was a big deal. When Bob Costas would show up, <laughs> yep. you knew it was a big deal. When I hear Tim McCarver and Joe Buck, you knew it was playoffs, All-Star, or World Series. That's right. And I always got excited when the big shots came because that was your time to shine. And that's yeah. what Hannah meant to us even back then in the 90s and 2000s. By the way, Seattle had the Sonics back yeah. in the day, yeah. too. So they had Fun a real – we spent a lot of time there mm -hmm. um, with that team, which was incredible. The glove, Gary Payton. And that's a really Very special cool. place. It really, I'm, I'm glad you had the opportunity to play yeah. there, too. It was awesome. You know? Great fan base, too. Yeah, great fan base. And, and, great, and you had some really cool teammates, too, there as well. As you're experiencing these different cities as a professional now, yeah. it feels like it's just an extension of how you grew up. Yeah. You end up at Notre Dame. There are a couple yeah. of domers in the audience, I know. Shout out Irish. But is sports always in your mind? Well, I think that when you grow up and you move around a lot, and I do think that it forces you to very quickly meet people. And it forces you to quickly find common ground. Yeah. So I am able to pretty much meet anybody and just strike up a conversation, which I think is a blessing. It also forces you to really assess your surroundings and be interested in other people. And I think that's one of your great qualities. Sometimes athletes can be like really myopic and, and care about themselves. And I think one of the cool things about Alex is he's always been like curious about other people. Right. And, and it's probably, probably why you're in business and probably why you're doing this. In retrospect, everything that happens in your life that is like a huge challenge. I do think those things all turn out for good. Maybe not all the time, but I think they can turn out to be a blessing in some strange way later that you might not even realize. Over the last 30 years, you have this male-dominated industry. Mm -hmm. How and what can you share with all of us mm -hmm. that allowed you to keep that integrity? Because it's so easy to take the easy cheap shot or, yeah. you know, go for a headline. But it seemed like you always stayed above it all. Yeah. And again, maintain that reverence and respect from everyone. It's really interesting, your observation, because I do think in the era of social media and now it's all about hot takes and look at me and how many followers do I have? What kind of arguments can I get into on X? I do think there's a lot of self-promotion. It's not bad, like do whatever you want. You know what I mean? But back, I guess, in the day, that didn't exist. But also being the only woman, usually, always, or one of the only women, I mean, you just had to have like a really tough skin and you had to like really, really just put your head down and work and let that speak for itself. Because I would not only 
have issues like I had with Albert Bell, you know, pretty well publicized. I had, you know, baseball was at, at times, certain teams were very, very difficult to cover um, back in the day because either the athlete was very traditional or a lot of times it was the manager. It wasn't necessarily the athletes. It was like some of the older people in the sport. Um, same thing. I was the first ever NFL sideline reporter for a year. It was horrible, you know, because of just, you know, nobody wanted you there, much less wanted a woman there. So I had a lot of really tough things. But I guess in some ways like that, that really did make me more determined because I was like, oh, OK, well, you know mm -hmm. what? I'm going <laughs> to. Yeah. It's go know? time. I mean, yeah. yeah. And it made me understand that my only recourse was not to make it about me, but to always take the higher road and just do my job because if I just did my job, that's really just the last word, you know? And also, that's what I was getting paid to do. You're not getting paid to make yourself the story, right? And to get into fights with people or to even promote yourself. Like, and I guess I'm old fashioned that way, but at the end of the day, someone is paying me to do a job and it is incumbent upon me to do it to the best of my ability. And that's why when I had the issue in the dugout with Albert Bell, I had a live shot for CNN. They were going to come to me and he was, you know, ran through the dugout wielding a bat and everybody fled the dugout except for me because I had a live shot <laughs> and my camera was set up and a little bat boy who was terrified. And he was, you know, wheeling his bat and screaming at us. And literally the entire baseball media was out there just watching to see what would happen. And I'm like, I'm not leaving <laughs> this dugout. It became a huge deal. And because it was a World Series stage and all the media and everybody was like, wanted to interview me and blah, 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 blah. And I was like, absolutely not. Like, I'm just here to report on what is happening on the field. It took a long, long time. But later he was fined the largest fine in baseball history. But it took a really long time for that to happen. But I guess that's just an example back in the day of yeah. just, you know, being a little stubborn and figuring out how to do my job. I mean, there were players. I remember Bob Nepper, who's an old pitcher for the Astros. If I was in the Astros locker room, he said, I will not talk to any of the media because you don't belong in here. And I was like, listen, I really don't like it in here either. Like, it's sweaty, gross. I mean, big misconception, like no one wants to go in a locker room. They're disgusting. So I was like, awesome. Do you mind coming out in the hallway? Absolutely. Same thing with Warren Moon. I didn't want to go in the football locker room. And he was like, you know what? I'll, co I'll come outside and do the interview. So I would just wait, you know what I mean? Just out of respect to my colleagues and everybody, you know, I just tried to find a solution, you know? That's crazy. To every There's so many stories. But you're alluding to, the, I mean, so many interesting sort of threads and themes that I know that we want to talk about. And, and one of them that I know we want to discuss is sort of that period in the 90s, especially, I mean, you're living it in baseball, mm -hmm. basketball yeah. really comes to the fore in the culture. What was it that happened and what did it feel like as Jordan comes into it and then the NBA is just established as this like cultural nexus? Yeah, well, I mean, what happened was Michael Jordan. Yeah. It was really interesting because obviously Bird and Magic came out of college. That natural collegiate rivalry kind of carried over, but it was really Michael. And the fact that what was so interesting is people forget all the struggles he had early, right? And how they couldn't get by the Detroit Pistons, mm -hmm. right? So we're talking about Isaiah and Dumars and, and all of that and this team that was like struggling to get by them. And then Michael, just everything that he did, you guys have all watched The Last Dance, but it was just magnetism. And the things that he did, and it was in the era, and you guys are talking cultural. Do you guys remember must-see TV? Yeah. yeah. Do you remember that phrase? Uh, so that was like Friends, Seinfeld, and ER, I want to say. Okay? So must-see TV, the NBA kind of became part of must-see TV on NBC. So it became must-see TV. And what we would do is... So again, you're not, it's not Turner. There's not local, right? It's not like ESPN. Like it's literally NBC. You want to see a game? We're going to give you three games. The basketball was so good because you're talking Barkley. You're talking the mailman, Carmelo. You're talking, I mean, stars. But you're talking three games in a row. There were five games on a weekend. So think about that. You get a triple header on Saturday, a double header on Sunday. And then it's followed by... Jurassic Park, maybe. 
So I'm saying they would invest in these. Right. In fact, Bob Costas had a really good line one halftime. He was like, do we have a special movie coming up for you? You bet Jurassic. You know, everybody was like, Whoa, oh my God. <laughs> but, like, but like that kind of epitomized that era of NBC and football had always been sort of a broadcasting tentpole, understanding how basketball um, could do the same. And by the way, with baseball, we had, I don't know if you remember the short-lived baseball network. Everybody kind of came together to do like the baseball network, right? But then, you know, we had, and I broadcast a ton of World Series, like on network television, one network, like really, really strong. And I, I still think the World Series has that. It really does. And probably because Alex is, you yeah, know, part of the broadcast yeah. team. But I mean, you know, it had that cachet and basketball had to get to that level. Right. It really did. It wasn't at the level of baseball. It wasn't America's game. You know, you used to be able to watch like America's game every week. Everybody watched baseball. The stars were established. It, that's what happened in the 90s mm -hmm. is that basketball, because of, I think, Jordan, but also these other stars right. who were like foils, you know, and then he left the game for two years. And boom, in come like the Rockets, in come like Olajuwon and Drexler. And Hannah, two questions. Maybe yeah. let the audience know here what that felt like on game day, right? Because yeah. I, I flew 3,000 miles to go see him. Did and you? I, I was thrilled, absolutely. Yeah. Right, because you, you only have maybe a handful of opportunities. My question to you is, how was that like game day? And maybe in a story or two of your exchange with Michael, maybe an interview, how was yeah. he? Yeah. Well, Michael, he was amazing. He's really funny. He's really down to earth. Now, Ahmad did yeah. all the interviews oh, with right. Michael. Right. Ahmad Rashad. Exclusive. I mean, they were best friends. So I did the Western Conference. Ahmad did the Eastern Conference. And he did every single interview with Michael. But of course, we all, you know, we knew Michael or whatever. So I first met him when I was in Charlotte. So Charlotte got a basketball team. I was the only woman in the market. It, that was a really hard market for me. Always getting mail about the way I, you know, like hate mail at the station, the way I dressed and stuff like that. People didn't, they just didn't, you know, whatever. And nobody was used to having a woman around. But so Michael and everybody in the NBA kind of followed him, which was kind of cool. What right? do you mean by that? They followed well, him. his behavior. Oh. Yes. And so we have the Charlotte Hornets. A big thing is Michael being from North Carolina. So they come in to play. It's like this huge deal, blah, 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 blah. And there I am, you know, in the locker room at, again. And I, you know, ask Michael, like, for an interview. And he calls me ma'am. I'm literally, like, 23. But it was like that Southern, you know, yeah. like, ch like, like, he was, like, so polite. And he was, like, so incredible to me. He was wow. so gentlemanly and everybody else just was like, whoa, like followed in line. And that was, even though Ahmad was his, his bestie and he did his one-on-ones with Ahmad, he was just exceedingly like that way in general. And NBA locker rooms were by far the best by far the best to cover. I mean, for me as a woman. Um, and a lot of the guys had the opportunity to maybe go to college, at least back then they went to college for a lot longer. So they had been a lot more used to media, big yeah, media right. being around. And right. that really helped too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That really helped in the NBA, but he was great. But he does, you know, to Alex's point and to your point, like he does set this new standard and yeah, you know, does. it does usher in this different way that we view not just basketball players, but athletes in well, general, athletes as business people. Well, Nike. Right? I mean, yeah, obviously the shoe deal, which is just the greatest story of all time. Yeah, it was the shoe deal. It was the shoes. It was the marketing. It was some, um, I mean, that that started it all. It's crazy to think if you say Michael Jordan to my daughters, for example, yeah. who are both teenagers, he's more synonymous with sneakers than yeah. basketball. He is. Well, people call them Jordans, right? They That's don't right. know. And it's funny. I did a whole sneaker series for Hulu called Grails that's really, really fun. So Josh Luber, who you, you guys know who he is. So he, he said that he had a pair of Jordans on and he had like, they had like a 23 on the back, right? And he said like some kid was like, what, what's that? Like, why is that number like on the two, back? Three on your shoe. To your point, like you have to go to YouTube now 
right? Even if you're, in, you're like, who's Michael Jordan, right? And The Last Dance did a lot, but I mean, he is, it's really the Jordan brand, yeah. right? Is almost, and, and has, is very separate from Michael Jordan, the athlete. Yeah. Yeah, it was really a, a golfer now. I mean, he's like into <laughs> golf. He has his, you know, he has uh, Grove, you know, his own golf course. I mean, he's really into that. I it's usually see him at the Ryder Cup. That's where we run into each other. Yeah. Just made a lot of money selling his basketball he team. He did well. He yeah. did well. Yeah. Yeah, I hear that that's too. a good investment. Yeah, I mean, it made a lot of money selling the basketball team, apparently. <laughs> Alex is like, yeah. Alex is like, <laughs> <laughs> well, Mark, Mark Cuban sold, too. I'm been... really interested to see what Mark does next. Yeah. Because yeah. I think that, you know, he obviously he's obligated to do Shark Tank for a while longer, but... He's going to step back from that. So I'm really fascinated to see what, like, a real – talk about a real trendsetter. Yeah. Another guy who's who we could have named earlier with the Mavericks are always, like, right there yeah, right. Um, in contention. And he's always trying to keep them current and in contention. But I'm fascinated to see what someone of that – caliber. Yeah. And a guy is always kind of forward thinking. I'm really interested to see what he does next. But to that point, I mean, and, and we're sitting here with an NBA owner. I mean, that's the other part of the business that has yeah. changed so dramatically yeah. to the point where we have someone like this guy mm-hmm. coming in and being like, this is a good investment and, you know, something that, that I can get behind. What do you make of that? I mean, as a business person, you know, you've started businesses, yeah. you've seen this. What do you make of well, that? Well, it's it's really interesting. I mean, to me, so I grew up not with an athlete. I grew up around all athletes around my house all the time, just giants. And, I mean, they would be around the house. They would come see my dad or come for Thanksgiving or, you know, whatever it was, Christmas party. So I was always very comfortable around athletes, but I grew up on the business side, right? So I always understood how devastating losing can be on that level, how the criticism that you take on that level. And I guess in a way, it's given me a really global perspective on sports, which honestly, the average probably commentator doesn't really have. And, you know, there's a a lot of criticism, a lot of yelling, a lot of, I think a lot of people who don't see at times the 360 picture of what it takes, right? It's not always as easy as, oh, go out and get this player. You need to do that. or You need to do that or all the, you know, I'm speaking from a, from a media standpoint of how we talk about owners and how we talk about general managers and something that's a really pet peeve of mine too, is how we like fire people how we say they should be fired, like that's just not okay. Because you are talking about someone's livelihood, right? And you you can't throw coaches and coordinators and GMs around and owners around like punchlines. Now, I understand that there are times when owners deserve a lot of criticism, something horrible like happened with the Clippers. Okay, that that's not what we're talking about here. But in general, because your team isn't performing, I mean, there's a lot of factors that go into that, including, by the way, the athlete's, you know, responsibility as well. You're dealing with people's livelihoods. Yeah. And, and what I understand being on the other side is, is a family. I've had for sale signs put in our front yard by fans. Okay, so wow. I understand that, right? I've had my dad fired. I remember going to Atlanta being in high school, going to a new high school, and to Turner firing my dad, GM of the Hawks, like months later, by the way, for making a deal that Ted didn't like, but that turned out to be amazing for the Hawks. And I understand those things happen, and I don't hold animosity, but I I know what it's like to be on the other side. So I guess for me, I always try to be fair. And again, you know, like call somebody, you know, you call people a bum or call them names or whatever. Like, that's just not okay. Yeah. It's just not. Like, if they're if they're not doing a good job, they might lose their job eventually. It's not up to you to fire the guy. I mean, it doesn't take a genius to see if a team isn't performing. Coming up, we discuss Hannah's career shift as well as making the leap towards business ventures of her own. All right, let's have a conversation about you. Some big transitions that you make in the course of your career. One of the biggest ones is being like, I'm going to go try something that's not sports. Yeah. Tell us about that, yeah. that experience and that decision. I don't know. I mean, listen, I have been doing this, I'm 40 years in the business overall. And I just don't think you can survive that long without being flexible and open minded. So the NBA on NBC ended. Yeah. 
And we also lost the NFL, by the way, kind of all in the same year. And I had always wanted to do morning television. And the reason that I did is because there were no women on television doing sports when I was growing up. So literally the only women that I had ever seen cover sports were morning television news hosts. I didn't immediately go into sports because I also couldn't get a job being a woman in sports. So my first job was as a heavy metal DJ. That's and where Hannah Storm comes that's from. That's where my name Storm comes from. San yeah. Antonio? Yeah. And that was Corpus. Yeah. C101 by the sea. There's the storm coming in late night. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It just rolls right. I Little, mean, you still got uh, it. Quiet Riot, Def Leppard, and uh, <laughs> Sammy Hagar, like back to back to back. Anyway, it was good. It was a really relaxing game. But um, yeah, and then I went to Houston and did a radio, and I would spin records on the weekends, and then did I did morning and afternoon drive sports, and then I started working for the Astros for their station and the Rocket Station. So that's kind of how I got started. You know, I majored in international studies right. at Notre Dame. So like, I really liked the news. I just thought I wanted to go into sports because sports is fun. Yeah. You know what I mean? But when that ended, I was like, I had little kids and I was like, I need a job. I need a morning job. I need some job. I just told my agent, I'm not going to be gone in the afternoons. I don't want to be gone all weekend. They're in school. I want to be gone the, the, when they're gone. You know what I mean? If they're going to get up and go to school, that's when I want to be gone and I want to work. So we looked at morning only morning jobs and CBS was starting a new morning show, one of their many iterations <laughs> of their morning show. Indeed. They got Gail King is obviously killing it and now. And how, how was that different for you? It's so different. It's pretty hardcore. But you know how, what was really good about it is doing sports, you can ad lib, right? Mm, like, you know, when, yeah. we, when we go up there and talk, we don't have, I mean, some stuff is scripted if you're leading to like a piece and a director needs a role cue or something like that. But for the most part, you're thinking on your feet, right? You're reacting. I found that was like critical as a news person. So I didn't come up like just reading the news. Yeah. You know what I mean? Then it's really hard to react. So I found that I was like a really good interviewer. I also was really used to not tipping my hand about what I thought. I was used to complete and total objectivity. I had also hosted Notre Dame football. And I said, and my boss was like, if I see one glimmer in your eye, little Irish, like happiness or whatever, you're done. So I'm like, I'm like, all right, good. So I was like trained. So the good thing about going into news is my personal views. And this is back in the day when we didn't have like polarizing news channels, right. definitely. And I was at the network and they would always give me like all the good political interviews, because you could not tell if I was like on one side or the other, you know, everyone would get mad at you, of course, right, right. but it was really cool. And then also like I got to do a ton of cooking. So I became a really good cook, which is my <laughs> other passion. And then we did a ton of music, which I already knew. It was kind of like my wheelhouse. And I love that. Super fun. And then movie stars. And I mean, it was a really, really cool job. I loved it. Was there like one or two interviews that you were, you can think that you were really nervous either before or during? I would say interviewing like President Bush, I would say 43. Yeah. Just like going to the White House and I was like pretty nervous. Um, what did you wear? But that's a great question. Thank you. Oh my God. <laughs> I can't believe you were, because so they have a little softball game on the lawn and I was calling their softball game later that day. So it's had to be sporty. So I wore like really crisp white slacks and just a white, a white sweater. What kind of shoes? All white flats. <laughs> flats. Yeah, you brew? I love it. I love yes. it. <laughs> and you know, he's so funny. He would always build time into his day. So he ran a little early or, or, or right on time. Cause he, he's kind of a social guy. Mm -hmm. do, do you know yeah, how, oh, yeah. you know how, he, of course you did. Guy. Well, yeah. baseball yeah. guy with Rangers and all that. Right. So I have my kids with me. And so you do all the, you know, you go in the line and you shake hands and blah, blah, blah. And he's like, hey, y'all want to like see the Rose Garden? And I was like, oh, okay. So just like me, him and my three kids, like we go wow. and he's like showing them the Rose Garden. And then he's like, takes us in the Oval Office <laughs> and we're hanging out. <laughs> like he's like showing them pictures of his family. And I'm thinking, don't you have anything to do? Like <laughs> what? Like what? Like what? what is happening here? And he was like, so nice, like talking to them out of nowhere, like magically. He's like, oh, I got a, you know, I got a meeting or whatever. And I was like, 
wow, like, thank you so much. This is great. <laughs> and then, like, out of the blue, a photographer appears, snap, snap, snap. And then, like, two days later, to your house, how do they find you? I don't know. <laughs> but um, is like, autographed, like, pictures, like, for each kid. I mean, wow. it was, like, the coolest experience. Exactly. It was one of those, like, weird, surreal experiences. But I got to say, like, before, and I shouldn't have been because he's so down to earth and genuine but you know that's, that's a little intimidating that's going to the yeah. white house right for an interview and say, it was yes. fine it was totally it was yeah. great and you got a tour of the rose garden so then you find your way back to sports yeah so i got fired that's what i mean by find your way back yeah. to sports <laughs> <laughs> Euphemism for you got let go yeah exactly um but I think that, you know, a lot of times when people are making personnel changes and they went, they made a 360 yeah. where we're taking out everybody. So I got fired. So that's OK, because all my colleagues did. We all left together, you know, one by one. Right. <laughs> um, and at the time, ESPN was starting a daytime sports center. They had never had sports center during the day. It was all reruns from the night before. And they were going to start a nine to noon sports center. They were going to launch it. And I had the combination of the sports and a daytime television mm. experience. Yeah. 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 And so when you get into that, you get that job, the sports world has, you know, kept going. And obviously you've, you've kept an eye on it. What did you notice that was either different about sports or, or maybe more pointedly about sports and media? That you could kind of talk a little bit more about, you know, sort of who you liked or teams. Right. You, you know, it was more personalized. What I noticed a lot about sports media was that people were personalities and that they became studio personalities. Mm. So I had always been, you know, I'd always like toe the line. The event is the thing, right? The person you're interviewing is the thing. In news, it's the story is the thing. It's always the story, the story, the story. You know, I came to ESPN in particular, people were developing themselves as, as, as legitimate stars in just the way they delivered the sports. Mm. Okay, which is really interesting. Right. So we had always had that on play by play. I mean, you mentioned Buck and Tim McCarver, right? We'd always had that kind of in the play by play mm -hmm. world. We had these big stars, but it was the studio sure. genre. And so it was more like kind of what we started at back when I was at CNN, like that had kind of exploded. Right. And because ESPN was such a national brand, I always call it like America's wallpaper. Like you walk in, it's there. Yeah. Like it's on every TV, it's on every bar, it's in the, you know, like in the airport. So these, these personalities had been able to like infuse a lot of humor and a lot of just sort of their twist on things. And I thought that was a really cool development yeah. in sports. And yeah. obviously that's, you know, huge now. Sure. Right. Yeah. Sure. I also want to make sure that we spend a beat talking about your production company, because I know this is a world you've been playing yeah. in. Yeah. Obviously, you know, we're all in, in this business to some extent. Yeah. How do you make the decision to do that? And how do you sort of create something that's, that is uniquely you? Right. Well, when I left CBS, so as a news anchor, there are certain things you can't do. I always felt like I wanted a lot of control, you know, over something in my life. Because I'd always worked for big, big companies. So I was like, okay, I have a control in my house and blah, 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 sometimes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And I'd written a couple of books because I knew like I could do that. That was like a creative outlet. But I wanted something that I could, control is not a good word. I want something I could create on my own, mm -hmm. like kind of how I wanted to do it, mm -hmm. right? So I started two things. I started my foundation and I started my production company. I kicked my one of my daughters out of her bedroom at the time. And she went into the other bedroom with her sister. So in this little tiny bedroom, I took my, who I'd been working with at CBS, Carmen Belmont, who's here. And we started, the two of us, which were still the two of us, we started a production company and a foundation simultaneously before I went to ESPN so mm. that I could grandfather it in to nice. wherever I went. Smart. So we, there's this thing called Upfronts, where, which you guys know, but just for you guys, it's like where all the advertisers come in and the, all the TV stations and everybody introduces what they're doing to all the advertisers. So they were introducing me at the Upfronts. And they were also introducing a, a film series called 30 for 30. And I was like, ooh, that sounds interesting. <laughs> so I went up a couple of weeks later at work. I introduced myself to the gentleman who was running 30 for 30. And I said, is there anything you don't have or you just can't get? Is there anything you're like, you, you, I know you have like two slots left, like anything you can't get. Because I was thinking, ooh, what do they need? Maybe I can. Mm -hmm. And they're like, well, we don't have a women's film and we don't have a tennis film. 
So I was like, oh, maybe I'll call my friend Chrissy Everett. <laughs> and so I did one of the original 30 for 30s, which was Chrissy and Martina. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's cool. And then from there, and that was a really cool, great learning experience. I did, um, a, I did branded content. I did, you know, some nine for nine. I did, I did, you know, Shaq and Dale. I did Danica for Epix. And last year did a, did a, my first ever series right. on a couple of uh, young black entrepreneurs, Eastside Golf, and who got the first ever Jordan Right. contract ever for golf. So it's been really, really good, but it's a very hard business. Um, the margins are really small. And so what I did is I just took a part of my paycheck and I just put it into my company. I just self-invested. So because I'm, I'm like an on-air person, you know what I mean? I wasn't like a, a, a TV producer at the time. So I was like, I'm just going to take a part of what I'm earning on TV and I'm going to reinvest it into myself, my company, and my um, foundation. And that's what I did. And we're still, you know, we're yeah. really small, but we, you know, do some cool stuff. I, I want to build on what you're saying because part of this is about an entirely new media landscape. I mean, you're sort of producing and yeah. selling into it. You right. are experiencing it via Amazon, you know, which, which obviously you did, you did some work with. Give us a sense of where sports media fits in this like wild west disrupted upside down it's fascinating world. i mean what many people have accomplished with youtube i think is is really great because you can monetize your content there which i think is super smart there are other people who are pouring a lot of content into other areas of social media that they don't own but that they feel like they're going to make it up in terms of um, being an influencer which is also fascinating to me there are, I kind of, my new thing is, okay, I may not be able to go out and get somebody to spend a half a million or a million dollars on a story that I want to do, but you know what I want to do? I want to own my, my IP. So how am I going to do that? All right. Maybe you're going to do that. Maybe you're going to do that in a podcast, right? You can, cause you're going to own, you're going to own your intellectual property. Um, I'm also writing like a graphic novel. Okay. Wow. So, and I have a, a 12 part, um, podcast with in conjunction my partners are the nba and iheart and it's called nba dna with hannah storm i do think it's important to kind of establish your intellectual property and i think that there's so many tiered ways of doing that so a lot of podcasts might become a documentary or might become in your case you know a special something like that there's layers and tiers to everything you can do and i think that's really cool it's cool to think outside of the box and not everything is going to be like a huge money maker but maybe it's good in another way. Right. I always figure like broadcasting, like you're hanging your hat there, right? And then like other things that you're passionate about, really, because it's kind of what it's about, right? Mm -hmm. Like you're passionate about it. You want to do this. You want to sit down and interview people. Like this is the vehicle that, that you came together to do. Like it's fun, mm -hmm. yeah. right? Yeah. Right? And maybe I think somebody's, so. I hope so. Maybe yeah. somebody's not going to sit there and go, all right, I need an interview, or I think I'm going to call up Alex Rodriguez. You know? <laughs> you know, but you're making it happen. Mm -hmm. Right. Right? Mm -hmm. And so I think that's like super cool. I guess like I always think like super optimistically, you know, and there's there's tons of projects that I have never made it to the finish line, right? But you got to try or just find a different way. Yeah. Like find a different avenue in. What advice? Take my 19-year-old who's a freshman at Michigan, and she's studying musical theater. Oh, cool. What advice would you give Natasha and millions of young people out there, not just young women, but young people that want to be the next Hannah? Maybe one or two, three things that you can say yeah. that can be helpful for them. I did a lot of musical theater. Okay. Yeah, okay. including at Notre Dame, which okay. is really cool because then you're kind of a ham, right? You're like a performer. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure I wasn't as talented as Natasha, so I was like, well, I'll go into TV. <laughs> I'm like an okay singer, not a great dancer. But I, I think, you know, this is so cliche, but it's I always tell people to work really hard. And that's, I know that's like goes without saying, but it doesn't really. Um, I think you have to just, grind, man, you got to work so hard, you know, do not, um, get discouraged when people say no, because I do think a lot of younger people, because of social media, they put themselves out there, they get negative comments and this and that they're always like, so worried about what other people think they're afraid of rejection and they're afraid to put themselves out there. And I think you have to, you have to put yourself out there and you have to understand that if, you know, people don't want to hire you or blah, 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 they're 
you know, the big thing now is like, oh, that company ghosted me. They never got back to me, <laughs> you know, for a job. Like that can be really hurtful, but I think separating, not taking things personally right. and really understanding like a global view of the marketplace, mm -hmm. understanding like what you're dealing with, like from big picture, that it's not, it's not always about you. Mm -hmm. Right. So, you know, working on dealing with failure, mm -hmm. working on dealing with rejection and staying positive and really, really sticking to, you know, what you want, but just there is zero substitute for working hard. And we're, and I think I just learned that being a woman in a man's industry, I had to almost work harder mm -hmm. than anyone else. Um, and obviously my husband is a, is a sports caster and he works extremely hard. And I'm not saying I work harder than him. But I'm saying that for me, that work ethic, I'm like, that will always separate me. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, there's, and you know, playing baseball and you also know getting up and not being what, how, what percentage of, of, of times does the ball actually meet the bat for a hit? It's, it's right. like, it's like a quarter of the well, times. If you if fail 70%, you right? end up in Cooperstown. You're, right? you're yeah. failing 70% and you're a freaking Hall of Famer. Except me. Right. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> right. I like that. See, I like that. Too soon. I, I know. I like <laughs> for the piece. But but I do think that, you know, think about that, right? Yeah. Think about and I always think about the baseball analogy. Mm -hmm. Like, and that's okay. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Because you're gonna fail like your whole life. And that's okay. It's like good. And it's funny you say that because I tell my children this all the time is that the fact that I came from a sport that you fail seventy percent of the time and you're really, really good. I always say like I have a PhD in failing. But like yeah. I eat nose for breakfast, right? Like it doesn't mean anything to me. I just keep, it's almost like a blind spot. I just keep going. Right. And I have friends that one person says no to them and they're for three months. They're like depressed. Paralyzed. Yeah. No, that's what I'm saying. And yeah. I, and I do think that is, is unfortunate. And I do think some of that is a result of, of just social media and the way that we're ingrained, you know, into like everything from your physical appearance to this, to that. And I, I do think that that's something that we, you know, I think collectively have to really work work against. And like Billy Jean always says, like, if, if you're under pressure, like that's a privilege. Right. You have to really, really kind of think of it that way. And also be open-minded. You know, what you're thinking of is the perfect job and the perfect life. You know, other opportunities are going to come along that you never thought of. And when they do, just like uh, for me, it's always been like, just have an open mind, have an open mind and try things you're afraid of. That's really, really important. Thank you so much. This oh, was this really awesome. fun. Thanks, Thank guys. you. Thank you, everyone. The Deal is a production from Bloomberg Podcasts and Bloomberg Originals. The Deal is hosted by Alex Rodriguez and Jason Kelly. Our producers are Victor Iveas and Lizzie Phillip. Our story editor is Siddhartha Mahanta. Our assistant producer is Stacey Wong. Blake Maples is our sound engineer. Rubab Shakir is our creative director. Our direction is from Jacqueline Kessler. Original music by Blake Maples. Casting by Dave Warren. Our managing editor is David Ravella. Our executive producers are Sage Bauman, Jason Kelly, Adam Kamiski, Kelly LaFerriere, Ashley Honig, Trey Shallowhorn, Kyle Kramer, and Andrew Barden. Additional support from Rachel Scarmazzino, Elena Los Angeles, Vanessa Perdomo, and Anna Mazarakis. David Dominguez is our director of photography. Jesse Ridner and Josh DeVoe are camera operators. Alex Diaconis is our video editor. Our gaffer is Rob Silcox, and our grip is Pranoy Jacob. AV technical support from Mitchell Sonati, Robert Smith, Philip Thomas, and Sergio Adams. Our production assistant is Hiro Roma. And a special thanks to the Wheelhouse team, including Brent Montgomery, Kristen Welton, Emma Gladstone, and Kaylin Liu. You can also watch The Deal on Bloomberg Originals, YouTube, and Bloomberg Television. Subscribe to The Deal wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening.